in our spiritual walk, we have to prioritize our, our responsibilities, our time, our finances. And maybe that's looking and saying, well, i got to create a not-to-do list for my walk with Jesus. Not to do with walking with him, but not to do with walking in the things of the world. To do walking with him. Not to do the things that so easily entangle us, that busy our lives, that, that, that overwhelm us, that begin to consume us. And maybe in that wisdom, we too can learn if we can prioritize and create a not-to-do list, we'll begin to understand the greater thing that God has planned for each of us. You know, it's actually not a new idea. Jesus did this. So Jim Collins is getting the credit, but really Jesus should get the credit. He understood how this worked. If we read, he gathered 12 disciples. He invited them to come follow him. The disciples, they're just average, but Jesus made them into exceptional from average. James says faith without works is what? What does he mean by that? James 2.17, faith without works is dead. Well, works are the evidence of salvation, not the means. In other words, you're not working your way to the kingdom of God. You come to the kingdom of God by grace through faith. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. But he gifted it. He gifted it so we can have an eternal life. Now, when he gives you that gift, he says there should be evidence of the gift in your life. What's that evidence? Evidence is the works, is the things we do within the kingdom of God, how we operate. And as Christians, our faith is not meant to remain stagnant within us. As a Christian, you've got to go beyond, well, that's good enough. Is it? Well, the Lord wants to move you to greater things. Faith in action is the transforming power of Christ in our lives. A transformation takes place And there's evidence of what's happened. Through our faith, we become living witnesses of hope to the world. And in this prayer, Jesus makes a remarkable promise to his disciples. This is what he says in John 17, 20 through 21. I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, the fullness of God. And here's the thing, that the world may believe that you sent me. How is the world going to believe that the Father sent Jesus? It's through us. That's the greater thing. Through us, the world will. That's profound, that the world may believe that you sent me because I am in them and they are in me and the world would believe. The passage is profound, a profound meaning. Jesus is saying that his followers, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the gift he would give at Pentecost, he says they're going to go and do a greater thing than actually he did on earth. Think about that. Jesus' physical ministry was confined to relatively a small geographical area. He wasn't mightily traveling outside a very confined Space, But that's where he was called to go by the Father, and he was obedient and did that. Yet, through the greater power of the Holy Spirit working in his followers, much more would be accomplished. That the gospel would spread throughout the whole world, touching countless lives. That's a greater thing. So how do we tap into this? Incredible potential. How do we become instruments of great things? And I'm telling each of you, you are called by Jesus to be an instrument of greater things. So there's two things we could do right now to encounter Christ in a deeper way. You want to get out of that stagnant feeling. You want to, you want to be mobilized from doing good enough to greater things. Encountering Christ in a deeper way, first thing is you got to exit the comfort zone. You got to get out of good enough. 
you got to be bold and say, Lord, I'm settling and you've called me to something more. Lord, I invite you to make things a little uncomfortable. What happens? He begins to move in our life and then that getting uncomfortable leads us to a place where we become more active to serve those around us. How we actively serve We'll encounter Christ. I'll step out of that comfort zone and I'll walk into actively serving in the ways that he's called me to serve. Now listen to me. We're called to serve all the time. You're serving in your household. You're serving when you pay your rent on time. You're serving when you pay your bills on time. You're a witness. You're serving how you greet people day to day. You're serving when you're faithful in little things so God can trust you with more. You're serving when you're obedient with your finances. You're serving in every aspect of your life. It's not just like, oh, wait, I'll sign up for something in the church and then I serve. No, that's part of it. But we actively serve. And then this encounter with God, his love, it transforms us. That, that we know that love and because we're transformed by it, we're, we're willing to go and share that love. We're, we're bringing that love into those around us. You're a witness of love as you actively serve those who we encounter. Others are waiting to come alongside and serve and you're going to see many other things that you're invited to to use those gifts. Why? Because every gift that's used here every weekend is for the benefit of others, not for the person. That we're constantly serving those around us, let alone what we do during the week throughout all the ministries that we do. All of it, it's about how we could be active in our faith and serve those around us. And I want you to discover that. I want you to have a holy encounter, a deeper encounter with a living God. And that's only going to happen if you believe that you can get beyond good enough and you'll move to great. Why? Because Jesus has called you to greater things. Amen?